Hi, thanks. Um, frankly, I think the idea of giving away the lichen for people sleeping is a perverse incentive. I'd rather have it for people being alert and awake. So I'm changing it. If you're awake, we'll give you the lichen. Um, right. Let's take a tour through human history. But I think starting with what humans have mostly done gives us a clue to what the future is. So we persistence hunted. We hunted animals by running after them for long periods of time until they became exhausted uh, in an unstable outdoor environment in more or less constant motion. Let's just say those words again because it really gives us a clue to the human condition. Unstable, outdoors, more or less constant motion. Now I bet you can all think straight away of what the opposite of that is and it's usually, uh, well besides now, except for me, um, your office, a schoolroom, uh, sitting in a car, most of society. So we've really managed to re-engineer society and you'll see these things from time to time that we've become hunched up, scrunched up in chairs, a very unnatural human activity. Um, and like marathon anything, uh, marathon sitting turns out to be bad for you, uh, which is something that we've come up with. And you'll, you'll see variations on these. Here's another one. Um, <laughs> where we're, we've transformed, that's the next generation. Um, no, I don't mean that, but what I do mean to say is that uh, we are facing actually the first time in human history where we've actually gone, uh, well it's not the first time, but the second time in human history we've gone seriously backwards uh, in life expectancy. So it might be that our children uh, are the first modern children to actually have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. Uh, it's not the first time because we changed things around a bit before. So we used to live a relatively long time when we were hunting and gathering. Uh, longer than thought because we had quite a few kids die in childbirth and infancy. Uh, if you made it past 30 or 40, you're going to live to 50, 60. Uh, and if you made it past uh, 50, you're going on to 70, 80. So this was a big, strong person, a brain that was bigger than ours, who had no sign of these chronic diseases. All of us, all of us will die slowly of chronic diseases. Uh, whereas our forebearers had the mantra, live long, drop dead. Uh, which frankly is what we're all after, isn't it? Think about it. And take that, if you don't take anything from today, just think about how you'd like to die. Uh, which to me is sprinting up on my bike next to my mate, age 89. I sprint him, just as I think I'm winning, I fall over, I fall turtle up, I'm dead on the road, and then he sprints and falls over at the same time. We both think we've won the sprint, um, and we've had a good long life. Live long, drop dead. Think about it. But that's not what's happened. And uh, if you look at some recent data uh, on the health of populations, I think one that stands out is in the decade from 1995 to 2005 in the US, uh, they gained two years in life expectancy. They lost seven to disability. So people lived two years longer, but they had an extra seven years of disability in those last years. Um, and is that worth it in what the human condition was, which is live long, drop dead? So obesity and fatness and these chronic diseases are never far from uh, the front page. In fact, this is the lead story in the New Zealand Herald this morning. Um, big news, we're fat, um, which hardly seems a reason to sell newspapers because we've known that for some time, but they, they might be struggling with the Herald. Uh, we've had many, many reports. This is just one on cancer. Um, we've really started to understand that, uh, as I say, the bulk of us will suffer from these chronic diseases, will die slowly, um, it will cost the country a lot of money. Uh, the last year of life uses about a third to a half of, of our healthcare expenditure. Um, and it's not because we're living long, dropping dead, it's because we're dying slowly and we're trying to prolong, prolong that life. Uh, there's been a real intersection recently between economics and health um, and how different things might affect you. Um, I think that says that uh, bicycling is, uh, will save you money and, and won't make you fat, whereas driving a car will make you fat and cost you money. Um, and the sub evidence for both of those. I just wanted to compare uh, two cities. This is uh, Copenhagen, where they spend about 4% of their income on transport-related activity. Um, this is Auckland, 
Um, this is how not to do it, where we spend about 16% of our income on transport-related activity. Uh, and uh, both countries are sort of fat, um, although the uh, Danish are down in the 40%, 40 to 45%, depending on the statistics that you believe, um, overweight or obese. New Zealand, um, we're at 70% overweight or obese. So there's certainly some differences there um, that are worth considering, and worth considering how activity in particular can contribute to saving us money and improving our quality of life. Uh, it's all good and well talking about GDP and these sorts of economic outcomes, um, but what we're ultimately after is well-being. If that's not what we're after, um, and you don't think that's what we're after, you might as well leave the room now. Okay, cool. Uh, right, so what of activity and uh, New Zealanders? Well, we've been measuring activity in adults and children now for, for a couple of decades. Uh, I've personally, well, my research team and I have um, put tens of thousands of these things, motion sensors, these are pedometers, but there's more complex sorts, accelerometers, which we'll talk about in a moment on thousands of kids, thousands of adults, and here's what you see with kids. This is year group in primary school, and it's uh, boys are uh, the top group and girls are the bottom group. And I think there's a few things that I've really found interesting. First, as kids get older, they get less active. Second, boys are almost always more active than girls as a group. Third, and you can't see it from here, that New Zealand children, like children in all developed countries, are 30% less active on the weekends. Let's just say that again. It's hard to imagine that, actually, because I'm an ex-child, you're ex-children. Uh, when you reflect on childhood, it's hard to imagine it's possible when kids have the most opportunity to be active, in fact, they're the least active, 30% less active on weekends. Uh, there's been a real change in the way that our children live our lives. Uh, I want to do some more detailed look at what kids do in the weekdays and weekends. I think it's, it's really interesting, from, uh, it gives us some clues to how we might help them. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll take you through this slowly, this is, we, we put real-time motion sensors that measures activity for kids in real time. This is a weekday and we've got three different types of kids. We've got the uh, top quarter of kids, we've got the middle lot of kids and we've got the bottom quarter of kids in terms of their activities. And you'll notice during the day there's some peaks in activity. Just before school, morning recess, lunch time's the biggie, and then for some of them, after school. Uh, what's interesting is that most kids, regardless of the least active ones or the most active ones, accumulate their movement um, in these little, these little brackets doing free play, unsupervised, no adults, do what you want, play. They all, they all clock it up. And that's actually where most New Zealand kids accumulate most of their activity. It's interesting what happens in the after school period. This is top group, the top quarter are very active. Look at the area under that curve, that's all activity. Um, they come home and they keep playing. That fits into the typical what I call free range kid. You remember that? It's the, the, uh, a more endangered species. Now there's still some out there as you can see. But that's the sort of child that comes home when it's dark, um, or their mother blows a whistle, or they get hungry, or a combination of any of those three above. That's the middle lot of kids, some area under the curve, and this is the least active quarter of the kids. They come home and retire to the couch. Um, and it's more pronounced on the weekends, actually. Here's the curve for the weekends. There's the top quarter of kids, out and about most of the day, huge area under the curve, the middle lot, and the least active quarter, who've stayed confined for the weekends. That's actually what it is, they're confined uh, as opposed to free range. So, the, the, in fact, we, we had a study with 10 to 12 year old boys where we showed that, and this is only 10% of those boys, watched on average eight hours of screen time a day. So to average eight hours, you've got to get up earlier than your peers, you've got to race to school at the last minute, preferably in a big SUV, Actually, the SUV's got nothing to do with it. Um, uh, you race home again in the car, you watch TV, you stay up later than your peers. Even then, you have to go harder on the weekends to make up for lost time to average eight hours. That's a small group, um, but nevertheless, a significant group in society. Uh, you see the same thing in adults. This is a, a different way of displaying activity data, uh, walking, standing, sitting across the awake period. 
This is an active occupation, a vet. You can see this uh, vet is uh, moving around during the day. Here's a retired person, still quite active. Here's what we mostly see uh, in the corporate and business world. This is a taxi driver with a motionless most of the day sitting on their butt. Uh, and interestingly, when we put a motion sensor on an inpatient in a hospital, this is someone lying in a hospital bed, uh, their trace is almost indistinguishable from someone in a sedentary job. Stroke, sitting. And frankly, that's where some of them are heading. So uh, that, that's an interesting one. I've, I've just finished putting, uh, doing this with, with a, a whole workplace, and you just, it's, it's amazing how much time we've, we sit these days. We've taken up marathon sitting, as I say. So, um, this is my kids at Takapuna Beach, lighting a fire. Uh, and frankly, you would have thought the police had better things to do on a Saturday night, um, but apparently not. Uh, so I left, and they explained it. <laughs> uh, that wasn't the last time we saw the police either, actually, because um, I, I, I don't know what you're thinking of me as a parent for this, but I like to take a fairly permissive attitude and, and, and so sort of promote this free-range kid idea. And about three months ago, I had a policeman knocking on my door with a couple of kids with him. I recognised them um, because they were my kids. Um, and um, the next-door neighbours who are the same age. And what they've been doing is... Uh, I'm sort of divided about this because it is actually criminal, but... Um, <laughs> They had been stealing the dust caps off car tyres, um, which at first place isn't that bad, uh, until you figure out that if you've got a really nice car, like a, an Alfa Romeo or a Porsche or any of those sorts of things, um, a lot of people have taken to pimping out their dust caps. Um, so you have these little anodized BMW uh, lathe aluminium dust caps, or little Mercedes ones. I've seen the whole lot actually. I've got the whole collection because the kids had the whole collection. <laughs> Um, which they've been selling off local cars for the um, God knows how long. Um, so half of them is going, oh, yeah, that's cool, I would have done that. And um, yes, that's breaking the law officer and um, I will accompany you down to the station. Uh, so they have been doing that. Uh, and we sat them down and the officer talked to them. It's hard to return them because most of the cars have left. Um, so we left them at the station, um, had the kids on a long punishment regime. Um, and it was only a couple of weeks ago that I was moving one of the kids' mountain bikes onto the car and I noticed that he still had BMW dust caps on the mountain bike. <laughs> so um, he's still learning about uh, behaviour and its consequences. But what we're starting to understand um, as kids decrease what we call their independent mobility, their ability to range around neighbourhoods, incurring risk and adventure on their own terms, um, is that it's affecting their brain. So this is a, a, just a little schematic out of a British newspaper showing four generations of, uh, of, uh, of kids in Sheffield starting back in uh, uh, the early 20th century through to just recently. And you see this massive, you take an ecological point of view, what you call home range, this massive decrease in the, in the free ranging that these kids have been allowed to do. So uh, the modern kids are allowed to go up to the end of the street and back if he's lucky sort of thing compared to the great-grandfather who was roaming all over the place. Uh, I tried to plot my youth at age 10, which was in Auckland's North Shore. Um, I, um, for some reason, at age 10, had a BMX bike and was allowed to collect beer cans. Uh, I have no idea why my parents let me do that. I'm certainly encouraging that. Um, but I used to range up into the north there. There's a Papuki golf course. Down south, there was a rubbish dump in Devonport. Uh, which I used to scavenge at, and, and out to the west in Birkdale was um, pretty rubbish and still is. Um, so that, that at age 10 was my range, unsupervised by myself on a bike, um, actually even before we had helmets. Um, and I had this big bit of metal sticking out of my bike, which I always used to hit with my right knee, so I constantly had an infected right knee. Uh, poor parenting. Uh, we've still got the big hands under my parents' house. Uh, here's my kids at the same age in uh, a much reduced range and I regard myself as in the more permissive sense, um, although they're obviously breaking the law, which is I didn't. Uh, what's happening here? This is interesting. We've, we've been thinking about physical activity and health and we've just known for some time how important 
physical activity.